Thanks very much, Amy, and pleasure to, to see everyone today. I guess it used to be we'd kick off these calls remarking on, on the virtual nature of them, but we're all used to it by now, so can really jump right in. I'm, I'm joined today by my colleague, Dinesh Melwani, who in a minute will share our slides, but as everyone knows, we're here to talk about getting ready for your first financing, and Dinesh and I lead our emerging companies and venture groups and tech teams at Mintz Levin, a large firm here in Boston with offices nationally. And we spend our day working with technology companies, uh, large and small, but we are active in what I might call the startup ecosystem. And today's presentation is very much geared towards the early stage founder. Uh, we can certainly take questions uh, at any uh, point in the presentation. I think our plan will be for people to post them in chat and Katya, when she's able to rejoin, will uh, feed them our way at the right time. But by way of background here, we're, we're sort of inverting our presentation a little bit. And when Dinesh puts the slides up, you'll see that we're going to launch into talking briefly about financing terms and structures, really the type of instrument your investors will be purchasing. And we think that's sort of a helpful way to establish sort of a basic alignment on terminology and, and to understand what we're all driving towards. I, I'm assuming you joined today because you're interested in working with, investing in a, a startup company. And so with any startup, but the lifeblood tends to be financing and in the earliest stages, it's making sure you're ready for it, but it's hard to do that without understanding what it is we'll be heading towards. And so that's where we're going to start out. And I think in just a minute, we'll see slides coming up, or at least I don't see them. Dinesh, I'm wondering if your I, screen is going to be shared. I am doing that now. Good to hear Perfect. you all. Let me know if you see that. You should. I see it. Excellent. I see Walt and, waving. And so then. I see there's somebody who's got him and some thumbs. Okay, this is great. The emojis have spoken. The, the live people have spoken. Uh, so they are working. Well, great. thanks for that introduction. I think we'll jump right into it. And like Will said, you know, you use the chat box or, or flag us if there's anything that comes your way. We were sort of thinking of trying to make this, you know, a session where we could both share some high level uh, points with you to keep in mind, but really dive into the questions you might have as well to make it a little bit more interactive. So let me jump into the the first slide here. So the, these are different ways that we'll address today in terms of how you might go about that first round of fundraising. The equity path is the more complex of, of the three that we'll be discussing, whether it's additional sale of common stock or preferred stock. Uh, there, there's some nuances there that we'll, we'll cover. I'll then talk a little bit about convertible notes and how that might bridge the gap on certain key issues that you'd otherwise be facing at this early stage in the company's fundraising life cycle. And then we'll talk a little bit about safes or simple agreements for future equity that have you know, the, the notes provided a bit of an alternative that was quicker and easier to a priced round, which is the sale of preferred or common stock. And then the safe instrument came in to address certain issues that investors saw with the notes themselves. So, you know, in sort of ease of use, where we'll progress along those lines and talk about the pros and cons of each one as we make it through our presentation. So, Will, let me advance this slide for you and let you kick it off with the benefits of a, of a preferred round. That's great. Thanks, Dinesh. And as I said, we're sort of going backwards. We're going to talk about getting ready for financing, but we need to understand what that financing is to have a fruitful conversation here. And I think I'd just highlight, if I didn't say this already, we're targeting about 30 minutes for the slide review, leaving us ample time to discuss your questions and uh, other topics as, as needed. But most of you, and I'm going to simplify our conversation today by talking about corporations, 
most of you with a startup probably have formed a corporation. Uh, it's possible you're an LLC. That's going to be a little bit beyond the scope of our topic today. So let's just all assume for, for these purposes, you're a more typical, probably Delaware formed C corporation. You, a solo founder, you, a team of co-founders, probably have allocated the common stock amongst yourselves at formation. You know, if Dinesh and I formed a company, we sort of viewed our contributions as equal. We're 50-50 co-founders. We own all of the common stock. That's probably the norm, probably fits many of your companies. What I think is important to just call out is why I'm jumping into Series C Preferred. On that first slide, you'll remember Dinesh highlighted that common stock would be an avenue to raise financing. And that's true. Uh, but what we find uh, most investors, your, your angels, perhaps not your, your true friend or family, you know, father, parent, brother, sibling, whatever it might be, uh, aunt, uncle, they may be happy to buy common stock and aren't going to negotiate much, if at all. Your angel investors, the more sophisticated community that's seeding startups, are probably looking to purchase preferred stock, and we'll jump right into that. But I think you as a company probably also don't want to sell common stock. There are some implications that you'd want to talk through with your counsel. What that's really doing is setting a price for your common stock to be sold. You know, willing buyer, willing seller, dollar per share. Now your common is worth $1. That adds complications later in life for the company when you get to awarding stock options where typically the, the desire is to deliver those on a very uh, cheap basis. And if you price it at a dollar, that can be a problem. I'm seeing the uh, slides have disappeared from my end. I'm going to keep talking because I can talk about series seed preferred, and I'm sure we'll get the slides back up here momentarily. With regards to preferred stock, what, what is it and what does it mean at its most basic? At its most basic, it means it has a preference. It comes ahead of common stock. So if you, a startup with your million shares split between your founder and co-founder, hold common, you're going to sell to your investor preferred stock. They'll give you, let's imagine, $1 million dollars. They will buy preferred stock. That preferred stock entitles them to get their money back before the common. That's the preference. When everyone talks about preferred stock, it means if things don't work out well or if they work out and you sell the company, preferred gets their money first. The general rule would be an investor wants to be paid before the common stock gets paid. So fine. We're selling everyone preferred stock, seed preferred stock, a right to get their money back before the common, which is probably held by the founders. Great. But if I, the investor, purchase preferred stock and this company builds, grows, and ultimately sells to Google for, let's imagine, a billion dollars, I, I don't merely want my $1 million back. That's not a great investment. I had visions of owning a piece of this company, and I'd like my piece of the $1 billion. That's where the seed preferred, your Series A convertible preferred that is sold to investors ha has a second piece here, and it's a conversion mechanism. It can typically convert into common stock at usually a one-to-one -one ratio. So now, let's go back to my little example. Dinesh and I formed a company. We owned a million shares of stock, and we are going to raise a million dollars. If my company is, let's just imagine the valuation, the pre-money valuation, the valuation of the company before that investment comes in is worth $1 million dollars. Little simple math here, just algebra. Companies worth a million dollars and there are a million shares outstanding. 
each share is worth a dollar. We sell a share for a dollar to these angel investors. They now put a million dollars in, they get a million shares. They own a million shares. Dinesh and I own a million shares. They bought one half of our company. And with that one half purchase, they bought series seed preferred stock. I just want to sort of go back through that because that's the sort of fundamental equation that, that sets us all up here. The piece of this that's important is to understand that the half the company they bought is in the form of preferred stock. Dinesh and I own one half in the form of common stock. And from there, we've set a valuation. Our company was worth a 1 million pre-money. It's worth 1 million plus 1 million, $2 million post-money. And that's the basic math. It's, it's very much sort of the opposite of Shark Tank, but it's the same math. There they talk about, I'm selling half my company to raise $1 million. And you can re-engineer that same valuation equation. I'm, I'm going to pause here. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of cameras off and not seeing our slides. I guess I'm just going to watch the Well, chat. I have the slides if you want me to share them from my computer. Yeah, maybe I, if you could, because yeah. it right, seems like a, we lost Dinesh's connection. Yeah, I thought he was back, but I don't see him. And I see, uh, I see others uh, joining. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to continue uh, as Amy brings those up. But the reason I spend so much time on preferred stock, valuation, et cetera, will become apparent as we get into the, the other instruments. And, and here's, maybe if we go back one, Amy, I think I'm just sure. here, I'm going to go back and sort of tie what I said to the slides. You know, this $1 million I've been talking about that was invested is very much permanent capital. That was $1 million into the company's bank account. Investor received a perhaps paper in the old days, more likely electronic share certificate on various platforms like Carta and others. But that $1 million is the company's and all the investor has is a piece of the company. In our little example, a 50% piece, but that's the fundamental investment. Uh, there's no debt on the balance sheet. This is equity. You know, why series seed preferred? versus Series A preferred. That tends to be the label when you get an institutional venture capitalist investing. It, it really is a label, although the venture capitalist typically will invest and get many more terms, sort of bells and whistles and additional features. So Series C preferred tends to be a little quicker and easier. The, uh, it's not a debt instrument. No, no maturity of notes to worry about. Dinesh is going to talk about notes in a minute. Uh, and I saw a question, but I also note uh, it ties to one of our drawbacks. We need to set a valuation here. You'll remember that we needed to sell a number of shares at a price per share. In my little example, somebody told us this company before they invested was worth $1 million. That sets a price for the shares, and lets us do our transaction. But yes, we needed a valuation. And with the early stage company, that is a very challenging topic. You're an, you're an entrepreneur. This is, you've been working on this for years. It's your hopes and dreams. Is it worth a million dollars today? Is it worth $4 million today? You can point to the discounted cash flow and other valuation analyses but really, there's no magic wand. It's going to be, what are you willing to sell for? And what is the buyer willing to buy? In my little example, my investor, the buyer, was only willing to pay, uh, give you $1 million for half the company. If they'd said, I'll give you a $1 million for 25% of the company, that would be a very different set of math. That would be, company was worth $3 million plus their million. Now they're 1 million of 4 million, 25%. And so we have 
a real uh, valuation question that needs to be answered with our series seed preferred. And we're really sort of setting a floor as the entrepreneurs, in, your, in my example, you're selling half your business just went out the door in exchange for that $1 million. Might have been the only investment you could get, might have been the money needed to realize on your hopes and dreams, but yes, you gave up half the company in that example. And so that is bullet number one here on our nuts and bolts slide. It is very much the sort of most important part of raising money and any of the investment vehicles we're gonna talk about, the preferred, even the notes and safes. At the end of the day, the biggest piece of the puzzle is valuation. Let me just quickly touch these other points and then I'll turn it over to Dinesh. You know, liquidation. Hey, well, well, can I interrupt for one second? Yes, There's Katya, a question thank you. here about, um, is there a magic wand to determine early stage valuation? Yes, no, it's uh, no. And that's a, a great question. Uh, no, it really, that will be determined by the price at which you're willing to sell a piece of your company and an investor is willing to buy. You obviously want a higher valuation as the entrepreneur, you know, to drive the valuation, you can certainly argue the value of your intellectual property, an incredible patent. You can argue that you are the best people in the world to pull off this business in an exciting large market. You'll make your case, but at the end of the day, it's the willingness of the buyer of the shares to part with their $1 million and how much of the company will they demand. And they're making an extremely high risk investment. Most startups will fail. I think we all know that and have heard that. And so the best thing you can do as an entrepreneur to drive your value up is create demand. Demand comes in the form of other term sheets. Hey, this fund will give me a valuation of 1 million a different fund or angel group will give me a value of $3 million. Perhaps you can play them off against each other to drive the valuation higher, but at the end of the day, it's simply a negotiation. Uh, you selling a piece of your company, them investing in that company. And that's a, that's a great question. We get it almost every presentation when we talk about this issue. These other points, I put them up here we may want to come back to them in questions, but these are the other terms that you as the founder and your counsel will be helping you through, but they have reasonably settled resolution in the documentation. Uh, there's not as much of a variation in where people land on these provisions, and we could come back to that in Q&A, but for purposes of talking about our financing, we want to focus on valuation. We'll talk about these later if needed, but let me turn it over to Dinesh to talk about convertible notes in the context of having looked at this really long list here on slide four. Dinesh, um, do you want to start sharing your own screen or I can still run the slide? Uh, I think you will need to. Okay, I'm not even fine. sure if you can. Can you see me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so I've switched to the iPad. Um, th this is what happens to the organizers. We were just joking about how things can sometimes go awry. And of course, the minute this starts, my computer and connection go down. So I've, I've scrambled to the iPad here. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just I say next when you want I, the next slide. I can't, please go to the next slide. <laughs> All right. uh, Will, I, I missed just about everything you shared, but I'm glad we, we divided and conquered this way. Um, I'll have the benefit of having heard Will present this sometimes before. So the complexities that I am guessing you heard but I missed in terms of what you'd be dealing with in a preferred financing are what you will be avoiding uh, for, to a great extent going the convertible note route. The cost is lower because the number of documents you're going to be negotiating is going to be limited. You'll negotiate a note purchase agreement and a convertible note. The concept of a preferred round is these investors are coming in as shareholders. So you're negotiating their rights at shareholders. 
regularly. They will not be taking over control of the company. It will be a minority position. So what that does is it opens up a conversation around what happens to protect those, the, that position. And as what I did catch at the end was Will sort of sharing that a lot of it is, you know, sort of set by the NBCA by now, but still that con- that conversation can, can take, you know, 30, 45 days as you're negotiating through a stack of four, five, six different documents and codifying what that agreement is. With a convertible note, the concept is the company is going to get to a point where it will be seeking that type of a fundraising round. It will be selling preferred securities and it will embark in those negotiations. But that will all happen at a future point in time. It's at a stage where it needs to take on capital and it wants to be able to go and prove to the market and to the investors what its value proposition is. And it doesn't need as much capital as it might once that has been proven. So you end up in a negotiation primarily on how much would the investor invest and what's the maximum value the company can have upon a conversion. So now we have a bullet here that says no need to value the the company, but you will have a conversation around a valuation cap, most likely to have that conversation. And that essentially means I think my company is worth 4 million today and I would like to sell a million dollars worth of, um, uh, you know, securities. And the investor, if that were a price round, would be saying, okay, for my million dollars, I've now put a million in out of five, I should own 20% of the company. That, that's what I think is fair. But that the investor might say, no, 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 you're only worth $2 million. I don't want to invest if you're worth more than $2 million because for my million dollars, I would like to own a third of the company. With the convertible note, you might avoid some of that conversation. You might be able to push it up. But the investor is likely to still say, in no event am I willing to invest if my money will convert at a price above 3 million in my example. Um, And that's because oftentimes this initial capital that you're raising will give you what you need to go and prove out your theory. But if you're wrong, that's the riskiest capital you've brought in because if you don't prove your theory, there is no company, there is no future financing, and there's no equity for this investor to get the benefit of. The, the other piece that is pretty customary is there will be a discount on where you price your next round for these investors. So I think 20% is pretty customary at this point. Uh, so you could say, okay, and as the company, you would be saying, I will give you a 20% discount on whatever price my future investors agree to. And the investor's response would be, well, that's fine. But if your future investors agree to a 10 million price point, I'm not comfortable with having my million convert at that level because it is due to my million going in at the riskiest point in time that you were able to even justify that price. And they would then argue for a cap. And would say, okay, well, the maximum will be four or five million. And then you'd end up with a document that says the notes will convert at the lower of a 20% discount of the next round or you know whatever the cap was that was negotiated. Why do investors agree to convertible note? Because it's, it's quicker, it's cheaper to negotiate. There isn't as, as much to negotiate. Uh, they're sort of betting on a founding team. They wanna make sure the value of the investment is there, but they can accomplish that with the valuation cap and the discounts, there is some interest. I think that's negligible for the most part, but that discount is key. High risk, high reward, keep the cap down. And in the downside where the company is not able to prove out its, its theory and its model, there is some benefit of being the creditor of the company in the event of a liquidation. Now, I, I don't think any investor is investing in startups today in convertible notes hoping to convert into equity are taking much comfort in the fact that they'd be a creditor if things went sideways, but it is 
you know, it is a, an additional plus. And the maturity date sets a timeline in which the founders need to go and accomplish what they said they would accomplish, which is the subsequent round. If that doesn't happen, it puts the investors in the driver's seat in terms of a renegotiation on what the terms would look like if you were to extend out that maturity date. Because again, in my example, the likelihood of the founders and the company having a million dollars available, you know, a year or 18 months from now to pay back that note is, is pretty slim. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Amy? Dinesh, can I interrupt real quick for two questions? Um, Please do. So I have one question here that says, do, do, do you see early stage or seed investments um, to control greater than 50% of the startup to achieve industrial milestones ever? I, I can jump in on that one. I'm looking at it in my so chat. I can't, I just went and opened the chat um, to read the question because I can't hear you. Oh, Oh, can, I, can, I can, can you guys hear me though? I can yes. read the question now. I can hear you. Okay. okay. I, I see the question. Do you early, do you see early stage seed investments controlling greater than 50% of the start startup to achieve uh, industrial milestones? Uh, no, I, I I don't think your early stage investors would take a controlling stake in the company. Um, I don't think early stage investors want to be in that position. I think for a large part, they're betting on the founding team, they're betting on their skill set, and they're looking to that team to grow it to a point where a more seasoned investment group would come in and put in the real dollars it would take to accomplish you know, those goals. We're not thinking or talking in this context about lifestyle businesses that might generate a couple of million dollars and be a, a very nice thing to have and, and pay out dividends. I think when, when we're thinking about these investors and these investments, we're thinking, you know, a series A raise in the $10 million range and, and growing from there until the company is able to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. I and the next question I see is stock gives part ownership and convertible notes do not. That's correct. So if you were selling stock, if you did a preferred round, you would actually be amending the company's certificate of incorporation. You would be introducing a new series of stock and the individuals who invested would be purchasing that stock. In a convertible note round, you are purchasing or investing in, in to, you, you are putting money in the company in exchange for a note, which will convert into equity of the company when it goes and does that next preferred financing. So at that point, you will then convert into a stock holding, but you don't have that at the time of the investment. And I see a last question here from Gary, which is what's the typical maturity term for those convertible notes. And I think that's going to depend on what your story is to the investors. You know, you, you can see a year, you can see 18 months, you can see two years, industry specific. It really speaks to when you think you will be able to go do that next round of financing. What are the milestones you need to accomplish between now and then? And how have you budgeted to hit those milestones. That's what this bridge financing or the convertible note is meant to, that's the purpose it's meant to serve. Will, I'm constantly um, hoping I'm, I'm legible and <laughs> if I'm missing something or it's breaking up that you'll jump in because I'm struggling a little on um, yep. confirming that everyone can hear me. Yeah, I, I can hear Dinesh, I'll take over here. Why don't you uh, establish connectivity and we can go to the uh, the next slide here, Amy, which goes to uh, the benefits of safes. And we need to sort of take from Dinesh's convertible notes presentation, the point on maturity, as well as the point on payback. Because as you might expect, an entrepreneur particularly with a money losing startup as they all generally are in the R&D phase is a bit concerned. Hey investor, I took a million dollars. I owe it back at some point. That doesn't really work for me. I, I don't 
have money to pay it back. And we should all be aware of the fact that in general, a new investor wants to invest in the company to grow the business, not to see their money go into a company to repay some prior investor. So entrepreneurs, and and in particular Y Combinator, uh, a West Coast incubator sort of said, wait a minute, notes are a little bit bad in that regard. They pose some challenges here. We ought to shift things. We ought to shift this so that this is really what it is. Investors give me money today as a company to be priced or converted in this future financing round when the venture capital investors show up. This is sort of early stage dollars from an angel. Nobody thinks they're going to get it paid back. They all think they're pre-purchasing equity in this venture round. And so somebody came up with the notion of a simple agreement for future equity. It's a contract. So it was a note. But this contract says, investor, you give me a million today. When I do a convertible venture financing round, your agreement will convert into those Series A shares. Same thing. Just like a note, it converts. The big difference is there's no interest. There's often a discount, so you get a cheaper price, but there's no maturity date. Your your money is in as an investor, and there's no 18 months, two years, by which it has to get repaid. With a safe, you negotiate the same valuation cap that Dinesh was discussing. You negotiate when it converts. You know, it may, for instance, as a safe, be converting in advance of a, a sale of the business. But it's very much a an evolution of where we started. We started with a preferred stock round. Gee, that's a lot of documents. They're an actual shareholder. We need to think about voting rights. Well, why don't we do a convertible note? Cheaper, faster, easier. Gets the money into a startup. That's great. Let's them develop a product and not waste a lot of money and time with lawyers and documents. The safe was just an evolution of that in my mind. But you certainly see, we see a lot of them in these early stage angel rounds. Uh, Again, sort of smaller financings, uh, sub, probably sub $1 million in aggregate investments. Uh, I do think, and I saw this question, uh, a safe is more founder friendly than a note for the big reason of the maturity date. Like stock, once the safe money is in, it, it doesn't go back out. In theory with notes, there comes a maturity date and a point at which a creditor, a note holder, can demand his or her money back, and most startups do not have the funds to repay that, which sets up a very challenging negotiation. So I think safes are more founder-friendly from that perspective. You know, are they more appealing to an investor than a note? Maybe not, which is the flip side of what I just said, but at the same time, I think a lot of investors, the sophisticated angels out there in the world, realize maturity dates, getting repaid on a note, never going to happen. I want to do something fast, easy to get my fifteen, twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 seed investment into this company so it can get going. Uh, what, what's this bullet here we have on warrants? It, you will sometimes see with notes people asking for additional rights and and a warrant is a right to buy future equity. Uh, We put it out there just to be aware of it. I don't see it a lot in early stage financings. Uh, Safes are not debt. Notes are debt. Debt can be secured or unsecured. You know, a mortgage in your house, that's debt with a, a security interest in the house. They can take your house. Similarly, I, an investor, could do a convertible note with your startup in which I have security in your patents. I can take your patent if you don't repay my note. Obviously, bad for the company and the founders, better security, perhaps, for the investors. These things do get negotiated. Uh, This point on amendments is important uh, more so with notes and safes than stock. With stock, you will generally 
have a construct because of state law that majority rules. Majority of the stock votes one way, you can make changes. With notes it's in, or safes, it's an individual contract with your investor. You definitely want to make sure your lawyers have language in there saying, you know, by some consent of a majority of the notes, we can amend all of the notes. It may be that you want to reduce interest in the future, and most of your note holders are happy. They're supportive. But you have that one note holder who's difficult, regrets making the investment because they're going through a divorce and just wants their money back. In that circumstance, you need to be able to amend that person's note without his or her consent. So it's important in all of your financing rounds that some will of the majority can change the terms. Life is uncertain. The life of a startup is even more uncertain. Things will change in, in the future and you want to be able to, to plan for that. I think this really sort of covers, and we should definitely talk about one more question, but this sort of covers the landscape of what we expect a startup like yours to be encountering as they're thinking about a financing. And I know our topic is getting ready for it. A big piece of getting ready for it is understanding what you're going to be selling in that financing, what securities, how much of the company you're going to be giving up. But we have some few other topics we want to touch on here, but let me just clarify one question I see. A, a safe is not debt. There is no ability at some maturity date in the future to demand money back. Unless within the safe, within that contract, it says, you know, at year three, you can demand to be repaid under this contract. That typically is not in there. Safes and the safe forms and a lot of actually really good materials are out there on the web from if you Google Y Combinator safe, you'll find their page with both forms of safes and some sort of explanatory white papers on the, the structure of them. But no, if the company fails, uh, the money is not owed back in the sense of a debt obligation particularly if a company fails and there's just zero to repay anyone, safes are going to get nothing, just like everybody's getting nothing. It, it likely may say in your safe, and certainly will say in your note, and by the way, it'll say this in your stock, that if the company fails and there's some money, you know, you sell the laptops and there's 5,000 bucks to pass around, somebody will be entitled to that if it's preferred stock they'll get all $5,000. The notes and even the safes, if that company then liquidates or winds down, likely will get repaid ahead of common stock. But that's, I don't think any of the people on the phone sort of care at that point. The company failed, you're all moving on. That's just a question of who divvies up what's left over. But the safe and the note are very different in the sense of that maturity date and a debt obligation that needs to be repaid. I hope that clarified that point. Uh, I think, Amy, we can go to the last slide, which we can just leave up as we talk here. Uh, Dinesh, I'll turn it back to you if you have yeah. connectivity, and if not, send it back well, I'm to me. Good. I guess I'd yeah. sort of turn it over to you and say, hey, we've talked about what we're going to be selling in the financing, but this company ought to be prepared long before yeah. that to approach an investor. And I think there's a few things we sketched out that we should make sure right. our companies are ready with. Right. No, happy to do that. Just one quick not, uh, note that I jotted down while you were talking. Well, I, I saw some exchange in the chat around, you know, why do you do a safe versus a convertible note from the investor side? And, and on the company side, why do a note instead of a safe? I, I think the audience is understanding it. And we're at an interesting point. We went from a very strong market with lots of uh, companies doing very well by way of valuations. And at times like that, you could demand better terms as a company, both on the valuation side, as well as on the potential protections that you would get, uh, be it a, under a convertible note maturity term or whether you agreed to invest in a safe because that's just what the company was offering. 
I think we are now living at a point in time where valuations are going to be readjusted. The number of investors has come down. And I suspect convertible notes will be more fashionable again as compared to the safes because people are a little bit more cautious today. You know, we're still very much in the thick of things, the market's still adjusting. But, you know, as an investor, I think I want a convertible note. I, I, I know that the investment, if the company doesn't do what we expected it to do, will be looking for either more money or will be folding. But I like to be in a position where at least there's some engaged conversation that's going to come a year down the road when that maturity term is coming close to, to being due. And that's the key reason in my mind why if you were going to do a series of notes, you have to be careful to ensure the amendment provisions, like Will said, allow the majority to make changes. The, the biggest one you'll be seeking if the company hasn't accomplished its goal of raising additional financing will be to reach out to the majority and say, hey, I need to push out this maturity date by another six months. And you don't want to be in a position where you've given each individual note holder the ability to, to grant that ask. So that was just a, a, a side thought to wrap up what we were talking about before. Like Will said, what are the other assumptions we've taken here when we're thinking of a company that's ready to be financed, right? Where you're looking at, maybe an individual, a team of two, three founders. If it's not one individual where you have a team of founders, the investors will want to understand what part each member of that team plays. And they'll want to understand that all of your uh, ducks are in a row. So if Will and I started a company, they want to know what role each of us play. They want to know how much we each own if there was a situation where we as founders were pitching them and this happens regularly and we thought we had a great idea and everyone loved the idea and the investor said, well, who owns this company? How, uh, how much do you own each of you of the company? And we sort of looked at each other and said, well, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. That's not a good sign. You want to be in a position where you've already addressed that. You know, Will's laughing because we've been in the room when that happens, you know, we move far along with a prospective client and then we say, okay, well, you know, we've got pen in hand. How do we document this? Who owns what? And three people in the room are all thinking three different ownership percentages. And we know it's going to be some time before we see them again, because those are hard conversations to have, but they have to be had early. And that gets fleshed out as you're starting to build up your your company you get to a point where you think there's something there you want to form the company you want to make sure the team members have all signed invention assignment agreements so the concepts that you have each brought to the table are owned by the entity that's going to be seeking that investment and every employee that has come in or consultant or contractor that you've used to help develop any of the tech that you are now uh, trying to seek investment for, have all signed up to those papers, essentially to put all of the key elements in the box that is going to be seeking that investment. Let me pause there for a minute and see if there, there are questions or, or, yeah. or other thoughts. And while, while those come in, Dinesh, I'll, I'll jump in on one question that came in. Uh, the concept of a 50-50 equity split uh, among founders being seen as hasty, a red flag, was it sort of... Too, too easy. Uh, I think it's really impossible to answer that in the sense of I've never seen that concern being raised. I, I get the concern, but I think the real facts are going to drive as to whether that's a sort of red flag. If I have two founders, one of whom is a business-minded person spending, having quit his or her job and spending nights weekends and 100% of their full-time work on the startup. The other founder is university professor, not quitting the university, may have had the idea, but yet has 50% of the company. That to me sends red flags. Uh, it, it may have been harmonious on day one, but I wonder if that's going to be a recipe for uh, an issue later. Whereas if in my example, it's Dinesh and I, he's the scientist, I'm the business person, he quits his lab, I quit my job, we're full-time 
co-founders working on a venture together, I don't know, 50-50 feels right. I, I worry an investor might say, oh, yeah, 60-40, gee, Will took 60. What a surprise, you know. He looks older in the slide here, more white hair. I, I wonder if Dinesh was his mentor, a mentee, and he, he forced Dinesh to take only 40. You know, maybe, maybe that 60-40 sends a, a red flag message. So I think I, I put those both out there as a way to say, I, I don't think the percentages send a red flag. I think the story behind the company as looked at against the percentages sends the red flag. So I think as long as you know, the founders are happy, united, and explain how it is they ended up with their split, be it 50-50 or 60-40, and that story makes sense and rings true, I don't see too many investors sort of second guessing that. You know, and it's key. It. Sorry, Will. Yeah. Uh, I was just, it's, it's... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say where you see extremes, you may have red flags. Wait a minute. Dinesh and Will are 90-10. How did Dinesh end up with 90% like that? That sends an interesting message and you better have a good set of facts behind that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've heard this, you know, in that hasty handshake sort of concept. Um, I think as long as each of the members of the team is comfortable with where you are, but probably the question we get the most is, how do we divvy up the pie amongst the three founders, right? What, what's the right way to do this? And that we can help with that. We can point you to articles and we've written about it and, and, and there's all kinds of tools out there. But at the end of the day, if you don't feel good about where this lands, you need to say something now because you're not going to feel better about it as the company grows, right? It's, this is the point in time where that has to be set appropriately. And there's nothing hasty about a 50-50 split with the appropriate documentation in place with the company's ability, which, and I don't think we've talked about restricted stock, but I think we recommend that when you've got multiple team members to have the initial stock that each of the founders gets be subject to a buyback right in favor of the company. Because if Will and I started a company and, you know, six weeks into our process, we both quit our jobs, he wins the lottery and says, you know what, I, I've always wanted to start a bar on the beach of Belize and I'm going to go do it. I need his equity to be able to go find another co-founder to make this venture blossom. And having the ability to buy back those shares is the quickest way to accomplish that. If, if I came to any of you and said, hey, I want you to help me with this, by the way, there's this other founder on the cap table who left, but who keeps this much equity, you wouldn't join, right? You, you wouldn't put that much effort towards a business where a big chunk of the equity is held by somebody else. So I think restricted stock is another element that investors would expect to see. And if it's not there, it's something they might put in place in as a condition to making the investment. Yep. Let me, I know we have five minutes left and we'll keep watching for questions sort of to bring it full circle. We talked about the investment, what you'll be selling, what instrument, stock, notes, safes. The key question in any of them is valuation and how much are you selling? And then Dinesh, you rightly took us back to the beginning to say, okay, before you figure out what you're selling, you better figure out who owns it today. Is it 50-50, 60-40? What's that makeup? And then you also need to make sure not just the ownership is squared away, but the assuming this is a tech venture, the intellectual property and all the sort of patents and inventions and software that go around the company are in the corporate entity where your investors are, are buying their stock. And so we sort of approach it from that perspective to say, get the house in order and then know what you're going to sell when you start your negotiations about valuation. And I think that's probably where we should leave it, which is getting yourself financing ready is also thinking about the process because it came out in that good question about valuation and how to, you know, what's the magic wand? There isn't one, but I hinted that obviously demand 
will drive competition, will drive valuation, and, and managing your process will be key. It will be awkward to talk to three investors, have one of them ready to invest, but want to put that person on hold while you have three other conversations to try and you know, use their price and drive valuations up. You need to have a coordinated effort. It's like a job hunt. It's awkward to have an exploding job offer while you're still waiting to hear from three other companies. So think about getting your house in order. Think about how much of the company you're selling or ideally selling. But also think about the process that takes, in between, takes place in between the numerous coffees and meetings and virtual meetings, I guess, at the moment, and presenting your business to investors all to drive and herd the cats to sort of one nice closing where you get your investors in at the price you want. I guess that would be sort of my concluding statement. Dinesh, I don't know if uh, you have anything or want to cover any of the, the final questions that popped in. I, I should look at the final point. I, now that the screens have stopped sharing, I'm glad my background was working. I'm, I'm impressed. I've got the MIT and Mintz logos up. I'm glad they're not inverted. Um, what final questions did we have? Let me see. The chat room. So Perspectives I, I, on equity crowdfunding services. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I am... I, I haven't seen very many of them go all the way through like these, you know, regulation CF type fundraises. I saw a couple of clients that were looking into them, um, ultimately decided to just go by way of raising capital from accredited investors. There is, and, and I, you know, there, there's, there's clearly room for it. I think we sort of have hit a point in time where companies might be, more uh, hesitant to raise money from unaccredited investors. That's just a, a gut feeling of mine. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it can't be done. I just I think any fundraise right now is going to be challenging, and going to a segment of the market that is unaccredited might be uh, something that's, I guess, not as heavily sought out. I think or, it's uh... or advised. You, you will probably get different opinions depending on who you asked. I'd go out there and say, I, I think it's a financing of last resort. If you have <laughs> any other hope to raise money, I, I would take it from the other sources, the more conventional path, the angels. You know, maybe for some businesses it makes sense, consumer products, et cetera. But if you can do that, go to Kickstarter and don't give up the equity. I, I have found the cost and doing it right to be very complex and it creates, and I've seen it create problems down the road on exit or future financing. So I think it's, if, if it's the one thing that will allow you to realize your hopes and dreams, go for it. But if you have any other path to raise money, take that. I think it's going to suck up a lot of your time and not raise you a whole lot of dollars. And with that one, the only other question I see here is just um, comment on pricing options with a debt or safe in the seed round. If it's a direct stock sale, do you have to spend money on the 409A? You know, I think a lot of our companies that we're seeing are using an onboarding with Carta and other platforms that allow for a 409A valuation. That's a tricky one that I would urge you to walk through with your, your own lawyers and accountants, there's no great answer because the valuation firms are charging a few thousand dollars to do an early stage 409A valuation. Uh, yes, it's a safe harbor for mispricing your equity uh, on the fair market value of those options, but I certainly see in the earliest stages, boards, particularly if they're more sophisticated, making a determination based on their own sophistication and determination of what the common is worth and awarding at that price, but you're right to be focused on it. Options for the most part need to be awarded at fair market value and determining it is either a costly endeavor or, or is one to be carefully undertaken by the existing board. I don't know if there's any concluding remarks, uh, Amy or Katya, that we should be 
I was just going to but... say thank you. Um, I know this was sort of technically a challenge for, I think, uh, me, Dinesh, um, but I, I do want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who attended. Um, if you, um, we'll send out the slides to everyone. We'll send out the recording um, as well. And, um, you know, folks who have more questions, I encourage them to reach out to Dinesh and Will uh, directly. So um, Yeah, and they're, they're, everyone's welcome to. I, I think we can't stress that enough. Feel free to shoot like you were in the chat boxes. Just shoot an email with your question. We're, we're pretty quick to, to fire back. We really enjoy this stuff. As, as sad as you might find that. <laughs> we like what we do so well there were away. there were 45 other people on here today that also enjoyed it so thank right. you guys very much thank you.